This is the third installment of selecting and installing a solar charging system on your boat. In the first installment, we looked at how to determine the energy your boat consumes so that you can calculate the size of the required battery bank and the solar panels to satisfy your boat's energy needs. In the last installment of Ask the Experts, we looked at how to select the type of panel that's appropriate for your application. And in this third and final video on the subject, we're going to look at installing the panels and charge controller to ensure the entire system is safe and effective. Once again, Ask the Experts, talk with Ken Wilson of Sensible Solar in Oshawa, Ontario. In addition to the solar panels, the key component of a solar charging system is the charge controller. Tying it all together, so to speak, are the wiring and connectors while keeping it safe with fuses and circuit breakers. Before starting any electrical installation, let me put forward this caution. Although we're talking about a 12 volt system, the danger of electrocution and fire are just as real as working with your 110 volt house system. So always turn the power off, disconnect the batteries, and wear protective clothing including safety glasses and gloves. If at any time you feel unsure about what to do, stop and ask for qualified help. So here are the components of our small solar charging system. Two solar or photovoltaic panels, one charge controller, and in our case it's rated at 35 amps and 12 volts, wiring, fuse and circuit breakers, now we're going to concentrate on these four items, but we have to be aware of the other elements in our energy system. Our battery bank is comprised of two identical 100 amp hour batteries connected in parallel to double the amp hours while maintaining our 12 volt supply. A power inverter to take our power from 12 volts to a 110 volt house current when required. And an alternate energy use, in this case a hot water heater fitted with a 12 volt heating element in place of the factory installed 110 volt element, but we'll do more on this later. So let's look at the charge controller. Solar charge controllers are rated by both amperage and voltage. So the solar controller that you choose must match the maximum voltage and current for the solar panel array and battery bank that you have. According to Ken, to calculate the required amperage of the charge controller, you have to take the short circuit current of the array and multiply it by 1.56. The short circuit current is defined as the current measured when a PV module is not connected to a load or any other resistance and is fully exposed to the sunlight. The value can be found on the label on the back of the solar module. In our example, this is 6.01 volts times the constant of 1.56 or 9.3 amps. So we went with a 35 amp charge controller and we know we're covered. Charge controllers come in two types. PWM or pulse width modulation and MPPT which is a maximum power point tracking. The PWM controller is basically a switch and it connects the solar array to the battery. The, the controller steps down the open circuit voltage of the panels to the charge voltage of the batteries. When the batteries are charged, the current is stopped. The MPPT controller is more sophisticated and by extension more expensive. The MPPT controller can adjust the input voltage to harvest the maximum power from the solar array and then transform this power to supply the varying voltage requirements of the battery bank. So let's do the math. A panel only puts out so many amps. For this 100 watt panel the output for peak voltage of 17.8 volts is 5.62 amps. With a voltage of the charge controller set at 13.2 volts, that's the float charge level, the 100 amp panel is producing 74 watts. So while you may purchase a panel rated at 98% efficiency, if you're using a standard controller, the system produces only 74% efficiency. The 74 watts leaving the controller divided by the 100 watts the panel is rated at for a 74% system efficiency. To get more power out of the same solar panels we have to use an MPPT controller. An MPPT controller can take a higher voltage on the solar panel side so we can combine panels into series to reduce wire loss and to save cost if we use smaller wire making sure that it's rated for both the voltage and the current. So the MPPT controller then steps the higher voltage on the panel side 
down to the voltage required on the battery side. The PWM controllers, well they require the same 12 volt setup on both sides of the system. A white paper produced by Victron Energy, which charge controller, MPPT or PWM, sums the controller debate with, as the array size increases, i.e. we put in more panels, the cable length will also increase. So the option is to wire more panels in series, and by doing that you decrease the cable cross-section area, and that results in a drop in cost. And that's a compelling reason to install an MPPT controller as soon as the solar array power exceeds a few hundred watts in a 12-volt battery system, or several hundred watts in a 24 or 48-volt battery system. So with our rather small two 100-watt panel system, Ken recommended that we go with the PWM controller, and in our case, a GF1235 by Green First Technologies. He just didn't see the advantage of a more expensive MPPT controller. And this controller is designed to be outside, so it was appropriate for our marine application. There is a link to the Victor Energy white paper below this video. One of the features we really liked about the charge controller that was recommended is that once the batteries are charged, we're able to repurpose the power from the charge controller to an alternate use. So by replacing the 110 volt element in our hot water heater with a 12 volt element, we're able to use the excess energy of the afternoon sun to heat our water. And that's a feature we truly enjoy when we've been at anchor for a few days and have no desire to turn on the diesel to charge batteries or to heat water for showers. Now, let's talk about wire and connectors. Using ABYC standards for wire runs, Ken Wilson recommended a marine grade AWG-12 for the 10 foot run, that's 20 feet return or round trip, for the panels to charge the controller. This is based on the short circuit current of 6.01 times 1.56 or 9.36 amps. Looking at the 10% voltage drop charts, we see that for 10 amps, the recommended wire for 20 feet is AWG-16. We felt that Ken's recommendation for never going smaller than AWG-12 for solar wiring built in a lot of safety for less than an extra dollar a foot for the wire. Many panels will come with waterproof MC4 connectors. But we're cruising sailors, and the system is exposed to the elements, and we knew that we'd have to be able to make repairs while away. The terminals are the weak link in an electrical system, and if installed incorrectly, they can create power robbing resistance. And resistance causes heat, and fires result from improperly installed terminals. Now, crimp-on terminals have gained universal acceptance in, the, in marine wiring, but to work effectively, they must be put on with proper tools. So rather than invest five to seven hundred dollars in a special crimping tool for MC4 connectors, we opted for anchor heat shrink snap plugs, which we already had on board and we have all the right tools to install. Now let's finish off our discussion on solar panel installation with a look at fuses and circuit breakers. Transport Canada has adopted the ABYC standards, which has specifics about solar installation. So according to Transport Canada and ABYC, circuit breakers have to have the same DC rating as the system voltage. And they have to be trip free, which means they cannot be held closed after they trip, be manual reset, and have an interrupting capacity to meet the system requirements. Fuses have to be of the same nominal voltage as the system voltage and of an interrupting capacity to meet system requirements. So in order to meet this requirement, Ken would normally supply an ANL fuse. But because we'll be cruising and often there's not a store nearby with a replacement fuse, Ken recommended we go with a 30 amp thermal circuit breaker, which we did. So there you have it. In three installments, We've shown you how to calculate your power needs, given you the information to select the most appropriate solar panel for your situation, and covered off what it takes to make a safe and effective installation of your solar charging system. My thanks once again to Ken Wilson at energy giant Sensible Solar. His contact information is linked below this video. Until the next time, on behalf of Canadian Yachting Magazine and InformBoater.com, I'm Rob McLeod. Stay informed.